Um, any, so on consent items, 3A through 3C, any questions on any of those items? No? Okay. Seeing none, so in the general business, I did have a request um, from the crisis response team uh, for the update to move them to the beginning. They have a, a meeting that they have to get run to. Is there any objection to having them uh, moving 4E to the beginning and then going in order from there? No objection? Okay. No objection. So we'll start with uh, item 4E, the uh, crisis response team update. So go ahead and take it away. Good morning, Council, and thank you so much for being willing to be flexible with this. I really appreciate it, and I'm sure our media does as well. Um, I'm going to share my screen. So this should all be in your backup as well, but I will share it to make it a little easier to follow along. So good, Adrian. So today's update is to provide just the action items that CRT has taken since the audit has come out. Throughout all of this, we've worked very closely with Michelle Crawford, who's been wonderful and has given us a lot of guidance on how to be in compliance with this audit. <coughs> so with audit recommendation number one, this dealt very closely <coughs> with 911 and their policies. So we did work very closely with Aurora 911. And as you see throughout this document, you'll see an Aurora 911 action item as well as a CRT action item. So this recommendation was specific for developing trainings for mental health um, calls for service for dispatch, as well as developing procedures for identifying and handling the mental health crisis calls for dispatch and working with CRT to develop the procedures for dispatching CRT and CIT officers. And we're also looking at the use of the crisis line here as that all does fall in within best practices. So the CRT action items that we have here is Aurora 911 did invite me and Sergeant Bunch to participate in the working groups for their nurse triaging line. And with this, we're trying to see if this translates into the use of their crisis line following a similar triaging process. And then we've also been communicating on how to implement a strategic plan for trainings, policies and protocols. CRT is offered to support Aurora 911 in all of those capacities to ensure that all the highlighted areas are addressed and in compliance with that audit. Um, you can see the Aurora 911 action items. I won't speak for them um, as I'm not entirely sure how all of that works, but I do invite Tina Bonetta, the director of Aurora 911, to jump in if she'd like, if she's on the line. And if not, I will move on to recommendation number two. So within the recommendation number two, we wanted to look at better and more effective ways to track those mental health calls for service. Currently within this CAD, there's no way to identify what exactly is a mental health call? And with that, we're losing the amount of number, or sorry, the amount of mental health calls that are coming through, which creates deficits in us for deploying our resources. So with that, we've been working with Sergeant Lou Allen, who oversees our CAD system and our other police softwares, as well as data analyst Ruth Eisner to explore the best, me the best methods for tracking those mental health calls for service. Thankfully, with the release of the new CAD, there is an option to select at the end of the call whether it was a mental health call. We're really hopeful that officers will be able to utilize this and give us more information of how many calls for service we're seeing that have a mental health component as well as substance use. Aurora 911 also mentioned that within the new CAD, there is a different event types to include mental health calls, and hopefully that will create a little more clarity on what kind of calls are coming into our city. And they're also evaluating the use of a mental health crisis protocol and translating that to AMRT and CRT. For recommendation number three, we're trying to expand the collection of data points, and the recommendation was to also track additional data points. For the CRT action here, we contracted with the National Policing Institute um, probably about four months ago, and that is a technical assistance program as well as an external evaluation. With that, they're going to be focusing on the, the data collection and resource utilization pieces of the program. They're going to provide some technical support in relation to finding both from the findings of both the internal audit and their external program evaluation. And their recommendations are going to be very specific to identifying performance indicators and different data collection measures, as well as methods of data collection to make it a little more clean for us. Our fourth recommendation was the request for proposals to evaluate staffing options for clinicians and a case manager to determine which option and partner best serves the city and community's needs. With that, we did post an RFP on August 1st. All of our proposals were due on the 29th. 
we did receive quite a good turnout. Currently, our evaluation committee is filling out all of those conflict of interest forms, and we should be evaluating those proposals next week and hopefully have a decision by the end of September at the very latest with the goal of being under contract around November to allow any transition of new contract scope of works to be drafted and whatever that might look like. Our fifth recommendation was to create an MOU with the Aurora Mental Health Center as there was not a signed MOU from the beginning of the program when it started in 2018. An MOU has been drafted and reviewed by legal. Our sixth recommendation of the internal audit was that we develop better SOPs that include leading practices for CRT and in cooperation with the clinician and update its directives. We have updated those directives and those drafted SOPs. They have been completed. They are in the final reviewing stages right now. Um, we met with internal auditor Michelle Crawford actually Monday or Tuesday of this week to go over those and make sure that they are in compliance with what she's looking for. And then our seventh recommendation was creating a CIT steering committee. And with this, we did create a steering committee. It is comprised of people from leadership of CRT and AMRT, Aurora 911, the Youth Violence Prevention Program, our Community Relations Department for both PD and the city, Falk, Aurora Mental Health Center, Aurora Fire Rescue, Aurora Public Schools, CUPD, and the local hospitals. We have met um, approximately one time. Our second meeting is actually next week. The first time we met was in June, and the moment we heard that this was best practice. We're also doing a CIT refresher course for officers who are currently CIT trained. We have officers who were trained about 20 years ago. So that refresher course is something that we're looking at being conducted annually, almost um, like a mini in service of sorts, or every now and then when it's appropriate. Um, we are planning to get with Michelle Crawford on this as well to determine the frequency of these. But we do think this is a great opportunity to give officers a little refresher on mental health, even though they see it every day. It's always good to just get a little refresher there. Our one of our last recommendations was that we work with the media relations office, community relations, city comms, and Aurora Mental Health to identify additional methods for collecting feedback and raising awareness of the program. If you look in your backup, you will see a brand new brochure that talks about how to utilize CRT, when are they most appropriately utilized, how to contact them, as well as information on our targeted violence prevention program. I'll also pull that up once I am done reading through this. We have been also attending the, or we plan to attend the AKCRT meeting next week as well to talk about the findings of the internal audit, the current status of the program, and how to most be utilized by the community. We also created this beautiful logo that Graphic Arts did an amazing job with. We're very thankful. We have a very talented Graphics Arts uh, department here, if you were unaware. And we're also working with the Aurora Research Institute, who is our current evaluation partner, to identify appropriate ways for collecting community feedback that is in compliance with clinical ethics codes. So with that, I will pull up our brochure. So this is what the brochure looks like. You can see our logo on the front as, long, as well as what is CRT? What are their goals? How do they provide those goals? Or how do they meet those goals? We have some resources on the side, the most commonly requested resources by clients who are utilizing the system. Courtney, so hi, yeah. sorry, Courtney. You want to make sure that you're sharing it like your full screen. Thank you. If you only shared the application, it's coming up great for the rest of us. Oh, thank you for letting me know. Sorry, I'm not technologically savvy at all. Let's fix that. There we go. Is that better? I see it now. Okay. So here's our brochure that we um, created the content for, but the graphics arts department made it beautiful. And like I said, they did an amazing job. So on this left-hand side, you'll see a list of resources that are most commonly requested by clients for us. You'll see an informational section that's asking or that's uh, explaining what the crisis response team is, how it's utilized, what are its goals. And then when you look on this second page, it talks about how, when you should request and what to expect when a CRT unit does show up on scene. We also talk about our targeted violence prevention program, which aims to prevent acts of mass violence, a very um, relevant and important feature of the program right now. We've received a lot of referrals lately, actually. And it also talks about this disclaimer that since we are a small unit, we might not always be available and that you might get a patrol response. So that, with that, that is the conclusion of my presentation, and I can open it up for questions. Mr. Merzlanik, if I could just real quick, uh, the other thing I would add, uh, kind of underlying 
the entire program uh, is uh, the budget. Uh, so um, uh, up till now, the, the program uh, has been grant funded from a variety of different sources. So in the 2023 budget, um, uh, we have transitioned the program fully to uh, being general funded. So it has stable funding going forward. Uh, we have funding for um, five clinicians as part of um, uh, the CRT program. And then the other thing we've added uh, to that is also a position uh, to do uh, data collection and data analysis. So that was also in um, uh, the internal audit is that we should be using data better. We also think that's um, in line with what we've heard from council. You want us to be data driven. So we think uh, having a position that's dedicated to uh, data collection and performance uh, is key. So we've added that in the budget as well. So uh, I could take any questions on the budget side uh, if there's there, but just sort of want to let that that's been something that's been out there. So um, we have transitioned them fully, like I said, in next year's budget to being general fund uh, funded. So it's nice, stable source. Uh, we still think there's probably opportunities uh, in the future to use grants to um, fund some planned expansions, um, but that you know the the base program really needs to be general funded uh, so that it's it's you know, nice and stable. So that's in the budget. Any questions for Courtney or for Jason? Uh, Council members, I have a couple of questions. Yeah, go for it. Uh, thank you, Courtney. Could you please reiterate the staffing levels of the CRT currently? Yes, thank you for that question, Council Member Sundberg. Currently, we are still experiencing very critical levels of staffing. Um, with Aurora Mental Health, we've experienced um, the same critical staffing that we have since the beginning of the program. Currently, we are at zero clinicians for our CRT team. We do have one case manager who's been wonderful and very helpful to provide that follow up piece on the back end. But currently, we have one AMRT clinician and zero CRT clinicians. Oh boy. So, um... We've lost a couple recently, it sounds like that. Yes. And it's challenging to, to attract new clinicians, it sounds. To be completely frank, sir, the interest has never really been an issue. Um, the pay has always been a large barrier. Every application cycle, we've gotten approximately seven applications. But when we get to the offer round, people do decline. Um, Denver and currently has 36 clinicians, so I'm I'm not under the impression that the interest is the problem. So we could be losing people to another municipality, it sounds like. We have. Um, back in August of 21, we did lose one clinician to Denver. What's the difference in pace? If you don't... It's approximately 20 grand higher. Wow. Denver. Something to consider. Yes. And so we can't really, with that staffing shortage, we can't really measure at this time response times to calls. That is correct. Now, we do still have extraordinarily mental health trained officers. They are further trained than the average CIT officer. They've received much more um, mental health and de-escalation training than the normal ones. So they are still responding as a CRT unit. They are to prioritize mental health calls that come through 911. They do also respond to regular patrol calls, but they are prioritizing those mental health calls. Obviously, that's not a CRT. That's not a co-responder team but it's a CIT unit and right now we are looking at evaluating some potential options for bringing in clinicians. I see Jessica just popped on. I'll let Jessica add to that. Council Member Sundberg, I just wanted to add that that's exactly why we're doing the RFP. And so we did receive four responses. Um, we have not looked through them yet, but hopeful that we can shore up some of the issues identified in the audit through that, both for AMRT and CRT for things like pay and benefits um, and retention strategies for clinicians. Thank you. And we did implement a retention bonus for our two remaining Aurora Mental Health staff at this time, very significant retention bonuses. So we are hopeful that that will keep them with us um, in conversations with them. They're very happy being a part of the program. Um, I do believe that the RFP brings some anxiety for clinicians is just the uncertainty of what that looks like for their jobs. So we are very supportive. We obviously want everyone to stay, but we want people to take care of themselves too. But great question. Courtney, will the the moving to a general fund funded um, help with with that? You know, giving more certainty to uh, to the clinicians that this is something that we're going to prioritize and not be dependent upon grant funding for. Thank you for that question, Councilman Brzezonik. Zavonik, yes, I firmly believe that being in a very stable source of funding does bring some um, relief to people who are in a grant funded position. I am hopeful that this will 
drastically increase the number of applications that we receive and the number of offers accepted. And Jason, just a follow up to the budget. Um, given that that the um, disparity between us and, and Denver, I assume that we're going to account for that in our in our recommendation for the 2023 budget, so that we'll be on at least on parity. Yeah, we we we, we use the numbers um, uh, that Courtney provided that really put us in a much better competitive position. Um, just to be clear, the the clinicians are not city employees, so we don't necessarily have the final say right. on what those um, wages are. Uh, that would be our, our our provider, but that's one of the things that we want to make sure we've got enough money there so that they can be competitive in their offers. And I would also like to add, in addition to the funding sources, we did apply for a grant through the Department of Homeland Security for their targeted violence prevention grants program. Um, we are hoping that that will continue to fund the targeted violence prevention program as well as expand it a little bit by including a case manager that is specific to that team. And we're awaiting that answer. Uh, Councilmember Drinsky or Sunberg, did you have other questions for Courtney or Jason? No. I guess, Courtney, I just have one last question. And um, I know that we use Aurora Mental Health for our provider for clinicians. Are we able to use other providers if need be? We are currently exploring that right now. We're looking at the contracts currently had with Aurora Mental Health and exploring if there is a no compete or something preventing us from utilizing a temporary source in the time being. Okay. Yeah, I just think that having, uh, you know, a greater pool of, of you know, resources, if, if they're maxed, which would be understandable, but there's other places that we could go to, to to get those clinicians and obviously be helpful to make sure we, we have the full staffed. Um, so I, I wanted to say thank you for um, your team's responsiveness to the audit. Um, you know, as I, I joked last time that whenever I hear Michelle give uh, an update, it gives me a little bit of heartburn, uh, but I, I am grateful. And I know that I'm sure my colleagues uh, share the same sentiment that I'm, I'm happy to see you guys took this audit um, and, you know, responded because uh, this is an important program for our city. And so, so thank you. And thank you all so much council for your support as for this program, not only within the budget, but advocating for it within the community. So thank you all very much. And thank you, DC and bachelor and director Jessica Prosser. And with that, I will stop my. Great. Okay. Um, so now we'll start back up at the top with the retail theft ordinance and I will hand it over to council member Drinsky to kick us off. Perfect. Thank you. So this ordinance adds a section into the motor vehicle theft ordinance that we recently passed. And basically um, it states for those theft offenses involving retail theft with the amount of value taken being over $300, a mandatory minimum jail sentence of three days shall be imposed. In addition to any other sentence imposed by the court, the court shall not set aside or suspend this minimum sentence with the three days to be served at the Aurora detention facility. So this is another uh, mandatory minimum ordinance um, in hopes to provide theft deterrence. I have uh, gotten some stakeholder input. Christopher Howes from the Colorado Retail Council um, asked for a copy of this ordinance. Pete Schulte sent it over and he sent back um, some thoughts. Uh, he, he would like to see something in here for the repeat or violent offender accelerator on mandatory jail days. I'm not sure that three days is much of a deterrent. The reason I went with the three days on this is because with the motor vehicle theft ordinance, council, council members of Onik worked with Arapahoe County to ensure that we could have space in their jail to hold people for up to 60 days. And I didn't want to overwhelm, uh, you know, that jail or that system. Our municipal jail, we can only hold people for three days. So that is how I settled on the three days. Um, Chris Howe's ultimate comments um were great news just this statute alone would be an amazing win for the city of aurora uh today at three o'clock the havana bid is having their retail crime business outreach public meeting um, and hoping to get a little more feedback but ultimately it sounds like you know there is a lot of support i've listened to a lot of uh business owners and i'm firsthand well aware of all of the crime going on in this city. 
Um, I do plan to bring forward um, some other ordinances based off of feedback that I've received um, in talking to the city attorney's office. I, I was going to maybe try to lump them in with this ordinance, but the decision was that it would be best to bring all of these ordinances forward. Um, another overwhelming uh, amount of feedback that I've gotten is that this amount should be lower than three hundred dollars. Um, you know why? Why are we allowing it to be up to uh, you know a mandatory minimum jail sentence starting at three hundred dollars? I'm open to feedback from my colleagues, but with that, I want to turn it over to Pete Schulte um, to explain a little bit further about this. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Dorinsky. Good morning, Council Members. Um, one of the, one of the concerns that as Councilmember Dorinsky talked about was it was about you know, what taxing the county jails, right? So I know three days doesn't maybe sound a lot to, to, to some folks, but three days in jail, I mean, they will do a full 72 hour that our Aurora detention facility. We don't do, you get one, you get three days credit for every day that you do. They will do it. So, I mean, that's kind of the starting point. And that's one of the things that Councilman Drewski and I talked about was if, if, if that doesn't seem to be doing what it's intended to do, we can always come back and try to, uh, amend the ordinance, but we could talk to our partners at Arapahoe County and Adams County uh, to say, hey, look, we tried it. We need to extend the jail time up a little bit more. Um, and one of the things about the $300 that Councilman Bedrinsky brought up, we, the, the intent was, again, there's going to be times, right, where supermarkets or whatever, people that are experiencing hard times may go in and take some food items or whatever that for lack of a better term, maybe terms that are you know, needs of necessity, right? That they, they need it. And that was one of the reasons why, but again, we picked the $300 and you know, we, we talked about it because that was one of the things like, what is, what is the number? I mean, some states have anything over a hundred dollars, kind of where I came from in Texas, anything over a hundred dollars was uh, a higher penalty crime. Um, but that's kind of uh, what Council Member Grinsky, one of the reasons why she wanted to bring it here uh, to you all to, to have that discussion. But, and just a last comment about the the other things that, that she has been wanting to, to do. Um, great ideas, and I and I the, the recommendation from our office is is to bring them in each a separate ordinance, so they can be brought and little piecemeal instead of a big massive ordinance, uh, so we can tackle these one at a time. So with that, um, I don't know if Commander Carlson has anything to add. She's the the P representative. Uh, but with that, we'll uh, we'll take questions. Councilmember Sunberg, do you have questions for uh, staff or Councilmember Grinsky? Thank you. Not yet. Okay. Uh, Pete, I have one question, and I think it goes to uh, Chris Howes' comment about violent and repeat offenders. I, my assumption is if the between what uh, uh, Chief Carlson and Chief Oates have put together on the um, you know APD side and trying to to find these prolific um, retail theft or thieves. Uh, if we have people who are are doing it in a habitual fashion and it reaches a certain threshold, or if there's any sort of violence involved, that would reach a, a level of charge that could go to county. Is that, am I right in saying that? Yes, uh, that is correct. Um, and, and we're hoping, and I, and I think, um, I, obviously I'm not going to speak for our wonderful judiciary um, at the municipal court, but I have a feeling that and I'm hoping um, that now that we're out of COVID and everything else, and if they have habitual offenders that are coming through that, Obviously, the three days is for no extenuating circumstances, right? That's usually the first time offenders, but I have a feeling the judges are not just going to be giving three days on habitual offenders if they do do consequences of jail time. So I I like the idea. You know, one of the things is is we this is something that we've never done before. So maybe follow the data and see what happens, and hopefully we can see a reduction in uh, these type of offenses. These, and this is really organized retail theft, right? That's really what we're targeting. Um, and that's why we're talking about the, the threshold and everything else. So hopefully, um, you know, when we, you know, there is a sunset provision in the ordinance, just like in the motor vehicle theft ordinance, we can kind of gauge. Uh, but I know Councilman Dorinsky will be uh, we'll, we'll checking the data on this and uh, coming back to, to council if we need to make any uh, tweaks. And one other question, I guess, for, for Cassidy, um, you know, as you're putting together you know, the effort to, um, to work with our partners, uh, our retail partners, and try to identify, you know, people who are part of these organized rings. I, is this ordinance, do you see this as, as a, a helpful tool to your overall effort? Yeah, I mean, I think it'll absolutely be, be beneficial. Um, I think it will have an impact on, you know, 
even if it's somebody that isn't quite prolific, but somebody that, um, you know, that might be the deterrent that they need to, to quit the behavior. Um, we've had some um, um, identified prolific shoplifters that were actually working on filing cases, working with our retail partners. So kind of since we kicked off the, this initiative, we've um, we've had some great communication and I'll also be at that Havana bid meeting today as well to talk with those partners. So I think it's a, it'll be a great tool um, for sure. I have a I have a question real quick. Um, Commander Carlson, will you, I'm sorry, Chief Carlson, will you stay in touch with me? I mean, as this goes into law, and so I, I would just like to know the data too. Um, you know, is there a ton of people that we're catching for theft between that hundred and two hundred and ninety nine dollar range? I, I want that data as well um, to see if I do need to come back and make adjustments to this because we're going to start at the at the 300. But will you please stay in touch with me? Yes, and we will continue to evaluate the data as well. Um, and that may be something uh, one of the things we're looking at is it might be multiple offenses. Um, you know, over a period of time that the retailers are saying this person has hit us. They've got the, the evidence to back that up. You know, they've hit us 4 times each time was, you know, $200 uh, a pop or something like that. And maybe that would be something that we could that we could work on and evaluate. Okay, thank you. Council member Zavonik, if I could offer 2 quick comments. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Um, first off. I totally agree with Cassidy at some point. Serving even a modest amount of jail time has an impact when the history and the knowledge in this around the city among these uh, criminals is that you do not serve jail time when you're arrested. So um, I, I think in concept, this is a great idea and we'll have to see how the implementation goes. And council member Jurinsky, you're, you're exactly right that we need to track very carefully the data, uh, pay attention to that $300 threshold. The difference above and below and 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 how that might impact you know future policy decisions you folks make the other thing is we've mentioned it in the past and we'll be discussing it again today at the havana bid meeting is i guess there's been so much frustration among some of these retailers that they have not been reporting as many of the crimes as they should and we need data on our end to identify the worst of the worst and so that's a theme that we're going to be Cassidy's going to be addressing this afternoon is we need um, uh, a renewed emphasis on the part of our retailers to to be sure that we are notified of these events. Um, and and that's that that will help us greatly. So that'll be one of the themes that we'll be addressing this afternoon at the meeting. Any other comments? Uh, Chair Zavon, I just a couple more things real quick, if that's okay. Yep. So. The other thing is this does not apply to all theft offenses. I want to be clear that the ordinance actually adds a new definition to our code that actually defines what retail theft is. And it's only those items that are offered for sale by those businesses that are registered uh, for us as retail outlets. So I want to be clear because I know there's been some some talk in the in the press about, oh my gosh, all theft in Aurora. It's just right now we're just talking about retail theft. And the other thing is, is one of the other things that I know by talking to uh, one of my bosses or the De deputy city attorney Julie Heckman over at prosecutions is over time we have to have the loss prevention uh, officers from these these retail stores and these small businesses they have to show up to court right and if they keep and this kind of goes hand in hand with the failure to appear ordinance that's already on the books that we passed uh, earlier this summer that we want to give an incentive for the for the retail or for the, uh, uh, the stores to show up to court because I don't want it. I don't want part of the 52% as Mr. Wilson always likes to tell us about how many cases get dismissed. We want to kind of limit that is that because the witness is not showing up. So we're hoping this will kind of go hand in hand with the policy that the, 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 the PD is doing, what council is doing to encourage. And I, and I think, and I want to talk to poor Ms. Heckman, but I believe that they will, the, the, the criminal prosecution side will work with the police department to try to streamline the process for the, especially the smaller businesses that don't have a big loss prevention department where they can get the information that they need to make sure they show up to court and kind of fix that process. Yeah, Pete, I think that's a great point. I think that when um, this ordinance is, is uh, implemented and in place, I think an educational campaign to retailers will be helpful. Um, I know that in the meeting this afternoon um, on the Havana bid, our DA is going to be there, the DA from the 18th. And, um, 
you know, he's he has some great examples of other municipalities that have really focused on this, and he's been able to prosecute cases and get significant jail time um, for some of these habitual retail offenders. Um, and so I'm hopeful that that you know, with this in place, we can say there really isn't any amount of theft that's too small. We want you to come forward. We want you to make sure you're reporting it because we have both whether it qualifies for as a as a state charge. Um, you know, at that thousand dollar threshold, I think is where they start. Anything below that, we have um, you know a municipal charge that we could bring forward. So there is an incentive for them to bring forward because, as we all know, retail is so critical to the city. Um, it's sixty four percent of our budget comes from from retail from sales tax. Uh, we don't want these retailers, big or small, leaving our city um, because of the the fear of of uh, theft and, and and loss. So I, I appreciate Councilmember Drensky for bringing this forward um, and. If there's not any other questions or comments, do you? Is there any objection to moving this forward? No okay. objection from me, sir. Okay, seeing none, then we will move it forward. Uh, next up, we have the weekend court mandate. Um, it looks like it's going to be Judge Day presenting. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Thank you for allowing the opportunity to bring this forward to the committee. Um, we're bringing it forward for information purposes, as I think that the committee has been made aware in the past. We are under a new mandate um, from uh, House Bill 221067 starting in January of 2023. Our court is now under a mandate to um, hold bond hearings within 48 hours of the person being brought to any uh, detention facility, if it's a county jail or our detention center. Upon notification that it's only a municipal hold, the law now requires a, a bond hearing within 48 hours, and that's absent. Um, it does not include any exclusions for weekends or holidays, which is what the current law is. It changes that law. Um, so we will now have the mandate to perform and hold 48 hour bond hearings. Um, we were very involved in trying to provide stakeholder input with the bill sponsors. Um, we had several meetings. We brought this forward to the Pfizer committee and with their strong support, um, we opposed the bill because there was no funding for it. It's There's no money in the bill whatsoever. And so now all cities um, and on our request for funding fell on, on deaf ears. There was no consideration whatsoever for uh, ending funding um, from the state. So now the cities are going to have to incur um, the requirement to um, hold the bond hearings and to foot the bill for the hearings. Within the backup, you should have received uh, a memo which sets forth in the table uh, the costs that our court will incur for 63 days. And we have 63 because not only of the 52 weeks, there's 11 week and or excuse me, 11 holiday weekends. Um, which will uh, more than likely require two sessions um, of court during the weekend. And so that what's, what, that's why we brought uh, or came up to the figure of 63. Uh, within the table, you see all of the different departments of the court that are going to be impacted um, by this unfunded mandate. And it includes the amount in, to a total of 421,207. Um, all of the department heads should be online to answer any questions that you may have. But we, again, we wanted to bring this forward to the committee so that you're aware of it. And I know that there'll be further um, presentations about this additional budget impact um, at the September 20th presentation and then the budget workshop as well. Happy to answer any questions. Any questions for Judge Day? Okay, see none. Hey, thank you uh, for the update. Okay, thank you much. Yep. Uh, item 4C, the public safety update or action plan update. Jason, um, I, since we went through the crisis response team um, and kind of touched on what they're doing, I think the big ones, and, and I'll let my colleagues chime in, but would be go through the first one, the, the staffing, youth violence update, and then uh, the encampment um, uh, update. Did I lose Jason? Helps unmute. No, sir. Thank you. Um, got it. So, yeah, that's good direction. We won't uh, dwell on the, the CRT. Thanks for thanks for the guidance. Um, so for um, 
let's kind of go through the staffing. You saw the numbers there. Um, and then uh, you kind of see how we're um, also including uh, any details uh, over to patrol as we continue to focus um, on patrol. Um, you see the numbers we have uh, in the academy. Um, and then I guess I would throw it over to the department uh, for any updates in terms of um, uh, current um, recruitment efforts and uh, other efforts. So anything, uh, Chief Oates uh, or a team to add? Um, Jason, I will report that we are considering uh, a second uh, uh, recruitment effort in the Atlanta area. We're targeting that for some time. In early October, we're putting our plans together. Again, the thinking is it's an area that is is rich in diversity among among lateral officers, and a a a uh, an area where pay doesn't match doesn't come close to matching ours. So that's our latest new initiative with regard to lateral recruitment. Um, and uh, I don't know if anyone else on staff, Chris, if you want to offer any other comments. Sure, yeah, so uh, Atlanta, we're also going to make a trip to Albuquerque uh, during the same time frame. So something a little bit closer to home, we've historically had uh, good luck uh, with laterals from Albuquerque uh, in not the recent past, but prior to that. So we're going to give that a renewed effort. Um, we are finalizing and it may come up later. I'm not sure uh, on the agenda, but uh, the epic recruiting. Uh, contract is providing their deliverables for the recruiting videos. The website is currently uh, being uh, having the uh, content put into it. So we're very happy with how that's moving along. And uh, other than that, uh, we're looking at the next group of recruits is 22 1B and we'll be graduating 11 of those folks uh, right in the middle of December uh, or will be the next folks that are coming out of uh, FTAP. So, uh, just put that on your radar, but otherwise, uh, I can answer any questions that anybody might have. I, I have a comment, Councilman Simone. Yep, go ahead. So, with these recruiting videos and stuff, um, you know, my fear is some of these other departments that we're trying to recruit from. I mean, if they look up Aurora, if they look up the Aurora PD, I mean, we don't have the best track record of our city's elected officials um, supporting the police. So I just wanted to say if it would be helpful, um, you know, from the three of us to add a video um, of us saying something in this recruitment video, um, all three of us, you know, just something, you know, we'd love to have you, whatever the script may be. Um, I'm certainly willing to do that, and I'm sure my two colleagues on this committee are certainly willing to do that. So I'm just throwing that out there. If if something like that would be helpful uh, to help recruit. Yeah, I would tell you that I think that we would certainly be happy to have your support, and we appreciate that offer. So uh, I'll talk to the team, and we'll see about the logistics behind uh, that, and uh, figure out how to make that happen. Appreciate that. Thank you. Any other questions for Here's Member Zavonic? Yeah, go ahead, sir. I apologize. I didn't read the the numbers of attrition uh, versus versus uh, how many officers we've gained. What is the net uh, number of gain or loss in the department in the last month? Uh, I'll ask Mr. Schneeback if he can weigh in on that. I don't know about the exact attrition numbers uh, versus the, the folks that we brought on board in the last month. We did not start an academy. Um, we've lost seven during the month of August. And I have to look up. I, I don't think I had a um, reinstatement start during the month of August. So it's a negative seven as a net because there's no ads. So. So what I would I would draw your attention to council members is Jason. Um, so year to date, we're at we're at a net of 20 losses. So sort of uh, John did a nice summary there uh, on their um, attrition update. Uh, we've had uh, 36 uh, total ads through uh, through the end of August. Uh, so 25 basics, uh, two laterals and nine reinstatements. So for 36 total ads uh, and then we've had 56. Uh, losses, so that includes uh, 31 resignations, 16 retirements, four medical retirements, um, two folks that have um, um, dropped out of, uh, of um, 
uh, FTEP, uh, and then we've had uh, two terminations and a uh, uh, one uh, death, so sort of a total of 56 losses. So uh, year to date, we're at a net uh, 26 down. Okay, thank you for those numbers. And then with respect to the outside recruiting out of state, I like the idea of thinking outside the box there. How has that worked out thus far? Uh, so we've had strong interest um, out of our efforts in uh, New York. Uh, so I'll, I'll let uh, uh, Chief Jewell talk about that. But we've we've seen, um, uh, I think, approaching uh, 20 candidates come out of um, uh, our New York efforts. So again, th those are, I think, strong efforts. So John, anything to add in terms of that or give some exact numbers? Uh, this is Chris. I can, I can take that, sir. Uh, so, yeah, we're looking at we, are have, we have a lateral academy scheduled for October 24th to start. Currently, we have 15 people in progress. We will not net 15 people, uh, but that's how many have uh, submitted applications and are at some point within that process as far as backgrounds, personal history statements, et cetera. So, of those, it's about half and half in New York and also some local. There's uh, Louisville, Glendale, Colorado State Patrol, somebody from Charlotte Mecklenburg is in there, Las Vegas, um, Denver. So there's, we have a kind of a wide range of folks that are in the hopper for the October Academy. Like I said, 15, we won't net that. And then with regard to the lateral Academy after that, that starts January 16th, we're looking at eight current applicants uh, most of those six out of eight are New York that has to defer from the October Academy just from timing. They couldn't quite take care of their personal requirements to show up in October. So they requested uh, January and then also the Albuquerque and the Atlanta trip are designed to continue to supplement the numbers for this January class as well. Okay, thank you. Other questions on this topic, which is the um, staffing for the Aurora Action Plan? If not, then I want to go into the uh, the youth violence um, update because I know that you know, with Christina gone, there's a little bit of transition. One of the other things that I think would be um, helpful to talk about is I know that um, in conversations with Chief Oates about motor vehicle theft and the number of, of kids. Um, juveniles that we see stealing cars. I know that that isn't directly related to our youth violence programming, but again, it's part of, I think, our overall challenge in the city, which is, um, you know, kids committing crimes, um, whether it's stealing cars or shootings or what, what, I think that this is something that we have to, to look at. And I know that we might, we're somewhat limited uh, in options of what we can do, but I think there might be um, reason for us to, to put together a strategy to work with some of our uh, with state lawmakers to address some of these challenges. But anyway, if you wouldn't mind, I don't know if Jessica or whoever would give an update on the youth violence program. Sadia, I saw you turn on your camera, so are you to give the update? Yes, I can't speak to the car thefts, so I don't know if Chief Oates wants to speak to that, but I can give an update on the youth violence program if that works for everyone. Yeah. Perfect. Well, good morning. Um, so we have a few things kind of happening. Um, just so you guys are aware, we're very similar, like what Courtney was speaking to. Um, we are also in the staffing um, place right now. Um, and so currently we are, we have the open position for the youth violence program manager. And I just want to say thank you so much for so many of the council members reaching out and asking for the job description and sharing it out in their networks. It's been really helpful. Um, to spread as far as wide to try to see if we can get a good pool, a uh, strong pool of applicants. Um, and so I'm, I'm receiving all of those applicants and screening those currently. Um, and then we will um, be looking at finalizing next steps with interviews um, in the next coming weeks. Um, so that's currently going on for the youth violence program. Um, and then on top of that, this afternoon, actually, we're meeting with the National Public Safety Partnership Group, and we're eagerly waiting for the assessment and to kind of hear what they've gathered. Um, so we will have that. So that's a really big deal because once we get that information, that's going to really help us kind of um, hone in and focus on certain areas. Um, and the last bit is that um, we are working very closely with the 12 NOFO grantees for the youth violence prevention um, program. Um, and so we're kind of reconciling some of the, the money that people have been spending and getting that money back out there. 
Um, so we're really excited about seeing really good things happening in our community um, for these focus areas for intervention and prevention as well. Okay, any questions for Cydia? No, thank you, okay. sir. Okay. Great. Thank you, everyone. Yep. Okay, and then uh, to the um, camping ban um, update. I'm going to look to Jessica. I didn't know who she had um, on tap to discuss um, the latest with that one. I was waiting for Emma to pop in, but I am happy to uh, go through it. So we have um, just listed the numbers from this month. You'll note that we added a few things that were asked for. Uh, previously related to the number of folks uh, seeking shelter. We've broken down um, the number of properties that are CDOT and non CDOT. Uh, we do have a meeting with CDOT today. It's been a, a long awaited meeting. We finally got scheduled and having that to talk about some of those key interchanges where we see um, several times having to go back. Um, and we're also working on uh, kind of emergency abatement procedures as well. Uh, the new pallet shelters are open um, as of a couple of weeks ago. There um, are plenty of folks on the wait list for the regular um, uh, pallet shelters, and then the new pallet shelters that have just opened are uh, saved back for uh, folks transitioning out of encampment. So we hope to see some good success with folks uh, taking us up on that through our street outreach teams to move into those uh, shelters. Um, and I would just say um, through the budget process, you'll see other things uh, listed as well uh, to get us a little more robust in this area, some additional staffing. Uh, we are still um, just limited in uh, the ability to abate some of these camps. Um, I just want to be clear. There's been some confusion that from the time that we get a complaint in about a camp, it's not 72 hours to get it um, cleaned up at 72 hours from the time we post that camp. And that's the minimum amount of time that we need to wait. And so typically we're seeing it's about a week turnaround, um, just so everyone's understanding from the time we get a complaint in, we would post the week before, probably on a Thursday or Friday. We're doing abatements on Tuesday, Wednesdays, and Thursdays. Um, that's when Keith and our contractors available. That's when our PAR officers are available. So we have a lot of folks to kind of come together to get those scheduled, and we need um, about a week to get those on the calendar scheduled. They all take different amounts of time, um, but we typically do um, anywhere between one and three a day, um, depending on the size and complexity of those. So I did just want to note that. Um, and we are looking to hire some additional folks to help with um, going out and uh, evaluating and posting the camps. Um, and we do prioritize them each week um, to make sure that that we're looking at that. So hopefully we'll have an update after our meeting with CDOT this afternoon um, for next month and some things to be working on in those areas. Um, and happy to you know continue collecting this data and reporting out on it and happy to take any feedback questions. Thanks, Jessica. I, I had I was just looking at this number. So the 411 notifications, can some of those be duplicative in terms of the it, so it could be 10 people saying, hey, we just saw this one here. Yeah, okay. That that's helpful. And um of the 25, so there's six that accepted shelter. Have we had to not abate because we don't have enough beds? No, okay. we've not run into that situation. Great. Um, I just that I plan to ask that every month, make sure that we haven't run into that situation, which is good to hear. Um, other questions for Jessica on this item? Councilman Zabonik. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, Jessica. Just a quick question regarding the abatement process. Does the city ever proactively go out and post notices or do we wait for citizens or others to request that? We do sometimes um, typically so when um, our employee that is out posting camps um, and when he's out and about in the city, if there's something that we come across that um, is a problem that's not already 
um, on the kind of complaint list, we can certainly do that. Um, similar to the way we approach code enforcement as well as we're out in the community already seeing things. Um, typically, it's probably on the list already, um, but sometimes um, there are instances where that can happen. Thank you. Other questions for Jessica? Okay, I, Jason, I guess the last thing I wanted to cover, and I, we, we didn't touch on this part, was the uh, the data-driven side of this. And and this might be for Chief Oates um, with, with the DART team. And, and I know that uh, there was recently some um, news articles about their team and, and the way they're using data to determine where to, to deploy. Um, just wondered if there's some updates on that. Um, and then also on, on motor vehicle theft with the ordinance, um, now, in effect, you know, I know that one uh, chief Oates once said to me that it's best not to look annually, but to instead look over the last four weeks. Um, I believe there's a new report out um, today that's going to show that Aurora is the third uh, in the nation for motor vehicle theft um, at, at year to date. And so I'm just curious as to do we have any data on motor vehicle theft um, and how the DART team is doing in response to um, you know, trying to, to track down uh, motor vehicle thefts in our city. Um, I can, if I can share a screen, I can show you the last 28 day report. We've had some significant improvement in crime generally and including, including motor vehicle theft. Um, I need a little help on sharing screen. <laughs> um, Reagan, can you help me on this, please? Uh, Chief, I don't have access yeah, to Chief, it's going to have to maybe help. the presenter. So at the bottom there, you should see um, on the ovals, uh, share. Okay. And then there you go. All right. And then so now see, how do I get this uh, one going? monitor? Maybe share the other monitor then. Or unless you have it up on this monitor. Go ahead. Take over. <laughs> Give us a moment. Is that it? Can you see it? I get, I think we can see your screen. I don't think we see it. Just shows a blue screen. I think you I think you're sharing the wrong screen. If somebody can give Lanigan sharing access, I can grab it, put it up for him. Let's do that. I'm sorry, I'm not technically savvy, folks. That's okay. Jed, you're going to show you're going to show the latest crime report, right? Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. Oh, hold so, on. That's the, that's the wrong one. Yeah, that's the right one, boss. All right. If you look four columns in, that's the 28 day trend information. Okay. So you can't ask cops to reduce crime year to date, but you can ask talented people to work on the most recent 28 days. And the purpose of those two columns is to compare the most recent 28 days to the immediate prior 28 days. And that's how we focus on, on trend efforts. Now, you can see there that most of it is red and violent crime is down 15% in the last 28 days. And major all, overall major crime is down 22% and motor vehicle theft is down uh, 30%. Now, is that all attributable to the efforts of the DART team? Probably not, but we think it's we're having an impact. Some of it might be the fact that kids are back in school uh, and some of our young people are actually going to school rather than engaging in other forms of mischief. But the bottom line is whatever we're doing in the last 28 days has had a significant impact. And so that I guess that's a partial answer to your question, Council Member Zavonik. And you know, time will tell, and data analysis will tell how effective DART is. Um, but you've seen some of the periodic reports we've put out. They're clearly making a difference. I think we're well over 60 arrests. And Jed, you might have some other information on um, anecdotally. Perhaps what would be best, Councilmember Zavonik, is we just put together a report for you for next next month. Yeah, on right. our team and and related issues around crime. I think that would be helpful, especially to continue to, you know, as we um, discussed during the um, debate over the motor vehicle theft ordinances, you know, whether or not that could actually have some sort of a deterrence effect in addition to what you all are doing. 
I'd like to continue to track that. And then also relative to um, if we can, you know, whether it's Denver or the state at large, I know that again, in the report that came out today, talked about the, the top cities in the nation for motor vehicle theft in Colorado had four of the top 10 um, with Denver and Aurora being number two and three in the country um, in terms of, you know, per capita motor vehicle theft. So huge challenge for us. I want to continue to see that, um, you know, be tackled because the economic impact to the victims, I mean, statewide, you're talking about over 48,000 cars were on pace to be stolen in Colorado this year. Of economic impact of well over a billion dollars. Um, big issue. I, so I appreciate what y you all are doing and, and um, I'm hopeful that the combination of what the DART team is doing and our, our ordinance that, that we can continue to see the, the, the trend that we see in this previous 28 days. Like you said, how much of it is related to kids going back to school or what other circumstances, we don't know, but just continuing to have this part of this update, I think would be very helpful. Uh, other questions um, for Chief Oates or anybody else on on the, this topic? Just a quick uh, clarification. In that 28 days, did I read that correctly? 560 cars were stolen in Aurora in, in 28 days? That is... Yeah, do you want to pull that back up, please? Yeah, I believe that was the number. Yeah, um, I'm I'm sorry. I'm trying to. I closed it out. I'm trying to find it again here. Um, Council member, I can answer that. Yeah, the previous 28 day was 560. The current 28 day was 392. So that's where the the decrease reduction of 30% came from. So in the past month, 392, the prior month to that 560. Wow, okay. Thank you for that clarification. That's enormous. And what this doesn't show, Councilmember Sundberg, is the secondary crimes that are committed with motor vehicle theft, which statewide is up over 520%. Um, violent, not just violent crimes, not counting property crimes, drug-related crimes, just violent crimes, secondary offenses, and motor vehicle theft up over 500%. So I, again, this is a critical topic. I wanna to make sure that we continue to talk about it because it just, it, the more it's in front of us, the more likely we're gonna to continue to focus on it. And if I could, um, you, you'll recall from our initial presentations on what DART was about. Um, DART is primarily focused on three kinds of crimes, non-fatal shootings, you know, with very serious aggravated assaults, robberies, and motor vehicle theft, precisely because so many of the first two offenses are being committed with people who come to and from the scene of those crimes in a stolen vehicle. So those are the pre three primary focuses of the DART team. Great. Thanks again for this uh, update, Chief. Anything else? So the, the, the next one, I think I'll just use this as a transition point, um, give um, APD some time to, to get ready for the next presentation, which is, um, again, as we talk about being data driven, uh, they are identifying uh, problem areas, areas of concern where we're having high call volumes. Uh, and so that led us to identifying uh, Colfax and Beeler uh, as an area of concern. And so the department has been working uh, very diligently to address that. And they wanted to come to this committee and talk about uh, what they're seeing there and, and some of those efforts. So with that, we'll tee up the next one. Chief Oates, go ahead and take it away. Okay, and I'll hand it off to Chief Carlson. All right, thank you. And if I could have sharing capabilities. <laughs> Still waiting for the opportunity to share the PowerPoint here. All right. Oh, here we go. Let me pull this up. Are you guys seeing the screen yet? Not yet. All right. How about now? It's coming. Okay. There we go. All right. And it's full screen, correct? Yep. All right. Awesome. All right. So the area of focus that we're going to be talking about today is uh, it. The focus is Colfax and Beeler. Um, oh, oh, here we go. Uh, we're we're going to kind of broaden that a little bit. Uh, so, the the when I show share data here over the next few slides, we're going to be looking at 
Yosemite over to Dayton, 13th up to 17th. So you're looking at about a 0.26 square mile uh, radius. And as you guys all know, this is a densely populated area to include many families that travel by bus and foot in the area. And so it was of utmost importance that, that we do all we can to impact the quality of life and the public safety in that area. And this has been and continues to be a priority for APD. So when we kind of focus in on, on some of the data, um, these large stars that are emphasized here, we've unfortunately had four homicides the last year. Uh, you can see the date that we're pulling the data from is uh, August 13, 2021 to August 14, 2022. Um, in the right hand column, um, we've broken it down a little bit further for this like half mile quarter from Colfax and Beeler extended. And then we've focused on some of the, the businesses as well. Um, there, you know, I believe there's many factors that lead to the crime in the area, some of which, um, you know, we've talked about endlessly with, with just national trends of increased crimes, you know, the effect that COVID had in 2020 and 2021 with the ability to jail folks. Um, and then there's a, a population of folks that are experiencing homelessness in this area as well. Uh, but one, another factor is that <clears throat> I believe that's played is Denver's had success with closing down some of their problem hotels just on the other side of Yosemite. And I believe that, that you know, that pushed some of those clientele into, um, into Aurora. So uh, when we look at calls for service, um, I'm going to actually jump to the next slide because I think this is this is most interesting to me is the projected totals if we stay on on target where we've been. So we're looking at uh, for calls for service well over 5,000 um, than what we've experienced the last two years. Um, if we stay on pace, we could experience another homicide in that area as well. And aggravated assaults, you know, those are going to be including the SBI, the shootings, um, you know, up, upwards of 100 um, if we're staying on pace. Um, I'm going to share some information that I, I believe we've, we've changed trajectory a little bit. Um, here's just a, a visual of calls for service and again, kind of a pie chart for those of us that are visual. Um, and and we're, we're using this data because, you know, it's, it's outlined in council's resolution to tackle crime using the data and the hotspots. Um, so this, this area became an area of focus based on the data. Um, patrol has been working this area when time is allowed. Uh, PAR has been instrumental and spent a lot of time uh, <clears throat> focusing on long term projects. Uh, but I will say that the timing of the DART deployment, based on you know, when the DART team um, was able to actually hit the street after their training, uh, has, had a, has had an impact in this area for sure. Uh, units within the Special Ops Bureau have done uh, high visibility operations and made several arrests. So we're going to kind of drill down on some of the uh, locations. Um, We've done several things with long term goals in mind as well. We looked at uh, businesses that may be contributing to some of these issues. First, we looked at the carriage motor in. Um, this is right at Colfax and Beeler. Um, you know, the, the problem was ongoing criminal uh, activity occurring on and near the property, people uh, staying at the property that weren't registered, that were committing crimes and going back to that location. Um, so, about two months ago, or, or two months prior to our last homicide, which was our homicide was uh, August 8th. And two months prior to that, our party unit was actually starting a process um, of the nuisance process under municipal code 62-63. And so we're about, we started evaluating the calls for service in that area, seriousness of crimes on that property and the overall effect that um, this kind of activity was having on the neighborhood. Um, you know, anytime we start a nuisance property, we're you know, we're starting with conversation with the business owner um, to try to get them to comply uh, with, you know, some of our concerns and make changes. However, uh, in this instance, the owner was issued a summons and um, he's been working with his attorney and they've signed the deferred action agreement um, that happened. Um, we served this, the summons on August 10th. That's what this picture is actually from. Um, a lot of entities involved when we're, when we're doing a nuisance. Um, and generally, it's a year long process and, and, and the business must comply with all the parameters. Um, and it also involves a lot of other city entities. Uh, we've had great success in years past with other locations, um, with other apartment buildings and motels uh, where we've been able to kind of clean it up, uh, clean up the crime in the area. And I just want to emphasize that APD and in, in particular, mainly our PAR unit that handles this has a great working relationship with other city partners to include code 
and tax and licensing. Another uh, location that we focused on is right across the street from the carriage motor and that's the, the, um, the Riviera. Um, PAR has met with the new ownership of the Riviera uh, because we'd started a criminal nuisance property documentation. It's in progress, but the owners are cooperating. Um, and they've, they've taken some tangible steps uh, to avert the nuisance declaration to include, um, you know, putting up a, a gate. Um, they're, they're looking at investing in um, high quality 360 degree cameras. So they are on notice, but they are, they are cooperating. And then right across the street, also from uh, right across from Beelers, we have the Family Dollar. You know, the Family Dollar is a, is a, an, an important business in the neighborhood for the for the families and the, and the residents that live there. Um, but what we were noticing is people they they sell beer at that location. So um, people will go in there, buy beer, and then come out and loiter and hang out um, and, and engage in in other uh, criminal behavior. <clears throat> Excuse me. So one of the things that we did is. Uh, FAR code enforcement, tax and licensing uh, visited that location, talked about some things that they can ad to, can address to um, uh, to help with issues. And so, so some of that is the no loitering and no trespassing signs that um, have been reposted and freshened up. They were kind of faded and and not uh, quite clear. So we they've done they've followed those recommendations and. Um, Ironically, they did get dinged for selling uh, to a minor uh, illegal alcohol sale, so they've got that pending. So that could could help us in the long run if they're not able to sell alcohol at that location. Other efforts that we've done to address um, issues in that area. So this this picture here that you're seeing is is Beeler Street. That's just to the west of the Carriage Motor Inn. Um, <clears throat> The what was happening is vehicles were pulling over there. They were doing drugs, uh, engaging in prostitution acts, um, and then also the there's a, a car auto repair shop just to the north of this location. They were also using this street for extra parking for their business. Um, so an effort to just clean up the entire area. Uh, we worked with um, with streets and uh, had these uh, no stopping or parking signs. Um, uh, put in the area that we can immediately start enforcing um, by, you know, ticketing or towing folks that have that park there. The idea is just to clean up the area. Also, you'll see these uh, overgrown bushes alongside here uh, along the motel. That's part of what they'll need. The carriage motor and we'll need to clean up as well. Um, additionally, I just got the update yesterday that PAR officers met with streets and um, pros to identify better street lighting options in the area, and that's been an ongoing effort as well, and to clean up overgrown trees and shrubs in the medians that and uh, along the uh, sidewalks that, that block good street lights. This is some cool technology that um, we we're, 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 we're testing out. We're currently renting these live view trailers. They were delivered and set up on uh, August 17th, as you see there. This project is overseen by our electronic support section um, and with the help of PAR getting those deployed in the areas that would be most effective. Um, these are the, the, the camera devices that you've probably seen in King Supers and Walmart's lots. It's a visual deterrent for sure, but it, it also captures, um, it captures the video. We can go back and, and watch it. Uh, and it can also be live viewed. So we've set up our PAR officers, our DART team, and some of our uh, Patrol officers with um, the capabilities to view these, so they they're they're watching uh, crime as it occurs and, and then moving in and making the arrest when appropriate. So this is some cool technology. We've seen um, it, it, it's it's been cool. These are kind of the camera angles that you can see in the area um, of what it's capturing, and it's really helped to clean up the, this area. This picture in the bottom right corner is in between two restaurants just to the west of the um, carriage motor inn. And both of these restaurants had a huge issue of folks um, <clears throat> really just hanging out all day, loitering, doing drugs. And um, and we visited with both of these restaurants as well, our officers, and, and uh, gave them tools so that we can enforce loitering and kind of to clean up the area. Because this is quite hidden from even really from Colfax when you drive by. Another area, and I'll, I'm about up on my time, but um, I want to focus in on another area that we've that's become a focus. So this dot right here is um, our Colfax Beeler area. So just to the south, um, the area I'm going to be just quickly talking about is this 14th and Yosemite over to Alton. So these areas, 
Uh, these parcels of property, they're overgrown, they're in disrepair. There's a couple buildings that are, um, you know, that are dangerous and, and actually probably biohazards and thick and overgrown. Um, it, so, because of the overgrowth that hides and promotes criminal behavior. So, uh, we have individuals and groups that are trespassing and squatting on these properties. Uh, in the past, temporary fencing and boarding up of the buildings have been ineffective. So, developers, um, uh, the redevelopment plans are pending city approval. Um, and just this week, um, APAR, along with code enforcement, has met to uh, improve the environmental conditions. They've actually started work on clearing these areas up. So, this is good news for the area as well. Um, and again, just looking at the totality of what is contributing to crime in this area and this, this, this specific area has been an issue. And so, um, you know, working with city planning and development officials to abate the overgrowth, the trash, the camps and, and, and demolish the proper or the uh, buildings that are set on, uh, on those properties. So, th it's, this is getting cleaned up, but this is 1 area that I just wanted to highlight that is is probably part of contributing to crime in that area. So. <clears throat> Early results of calls for service, that's going to be this GFS and then the, the, the uh, case reports that we're pulling the, the criminal cases suggest that compared to a similar time frame last month, that, that there's a notable decrease in crime. These are very early stats, but we're you know excited for the dip that we've seen. Um, and we're going to further you know crime mitigation efforts will continue as the data collection um, and we, we, can, we expect to see continued positive impact in the area. Um, and throughout our efforts, we've also had positive communication with the Northwest stakeholder group and other area residents and businesses about the impact that we're having. So that wraps up what I have to say. Um, any questions from you folks? Questions? I, I have one, I guess, Cassie. Um, those cameras, those mobile cameras, are is there a need for, um, for them in other places, and and if so, just, just ballpark. What do they cost? Yeah, they they're they're not cheap. It's a really cool technology. Um, I and ESS is definitely exploring um, us whether we we build our own. We continue kind of renting them. Um, it is on on kind of our radar to uh, continue pursuing these because they could be effective. In, in many forms and it, you know, moving them to other crime areas, moving them to the retail areas to deter theft. Um, I, I think we've seen the value in them um, in, in the way that, that you're able to, to watch them live. And um, so you can, you know, have, for example, the dark guys, you know, they could set off, we watch a crime happen and then move in and then collect the evidence from that point. So definitely something we are uh, exploring. ESS has taken the lead on on what that looks like. Okay. I, I believe they're in the twenty-five to thirty thousand dollars a range each, and they're also light towers. They also light up the block. Um, yeah. So we have real interest in the technology. Obviously, you know, it's, there's costs associated with it, and so that's why we're experimenting with these two. Yeah. Great. Okay. Any other uh, questions, Chief Carlson? Okay. All right. Thank you. And then, so final item. Um, for F is the Cherry Creek School District donation. It looks like Chief Oates, you're up for this one. Yes, very briefly, uh, I had sent an email to the to all of you, all of the commission, uh, the council, um, I, I guess a week and a half ago. Um, uh, as you know, we returned six officers to um, uh, the, the, the three high schools in Cherry Creek system beginning this year. Um, it was it was a challenge to find those bodies across the organization, but we did. Um, that gesture was very very well received, and uh, as has happened periodically in the past, Cherry Creek School District has made a donation to support our uh, our school resource officer program. Um, this time, the donation was one hundred eighty five thousand dollars. I had written a summary to you folks. Essentially, the bulk of that is being spent on equipping all of our patrol cars with various devices, breaching tools that we can get into any locked door. Um, we hope to have all that equipment deployed by mid semester uh, this this year. Um, we're also arranging for each of the school systems are different. 
We're arranging, though, for either a key card access or a special key of some kind uh, that will be on every patrol car ring that will get us into, so we don't have to break doors into any of the APS or Cherry Creek uh, schools. Um, there are some costs associated with that, which are going to be covered by this grant. Um, also, as has happened periodically in the past, we'll be able to use the money this year to send all of our SROs to the National Conference next year. I think it's in Indianapolis during the summer months when school is not in session. Uh, that's the same conference that Aurora actually hosted at the Gaylord uh, this year. Um, and then there is some money left over in reserve that we'll, I'm sure we'll find uses for within the school resource officer system. Now, uh, we have not operated with an IGA or an MOU with the Cherry Creek School District in the past. Uh, uh, the, the superintendent asked that we consider actually getting to a written document that ex uh, explains our roles and responsibilities and support for each other between the school district and the police department in the city. Uh, and so we have a draft of an IGA that we are working on with legal, whether it ends up being an actual intergovernmental agreement, a memo of understanding, a letter, you know, that's subject to consultation with our attorneys. But the initial draft um, that I've seen seems reasonable in terms of outlining responsibilities for the department, the city, and the school district. And eventually that, that, uh, that document in some form will be coming uh, to council for uh, information and support. So, um, so they are asking, which is something new for us, is an actual written understanding of of the roles uh, that that we play to support the school system, and the school system plays to support us. So um, that's the update, and we are of course thrilled and excited and very thankful for the donation. Uh, uh, by the Cherry Creek School District, which is funneled through as as requested through an appropriate nonprofit. And that nonprofit is the uh, uh, Aurora Police Foundation. And if you have any questions for the foundation, uh, the executive director, Naomi Caldwell, I believe is still on the call. Great. Thanks, Chief. Uh, any questions about uh, this item for Chief Oates? Okay, seeing none. Uh, miscellaneous matters, anything for the good of the order? Okay, um, confirm, so the next meeting is Thursday, October 13th, same time. Any issues with that? Uh, the only thing I'll note for council is uh, that's the same day as the state of the city address. So we'll just, uh, you know, obviously we're in the meeting in the morning uh, that typically is given over lunch. Just want you to all know for scheduling purposes, um, yeah, you know, we, we don't see a problem with it, but just want to bring that to your attention. Yeah, just remind me, Jason, we can try to keep that schedule a little bit, um, a little bit truncated so that we don't go as, as over. Uh, okay, anything else? If not, we will say meeting is adjourned. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.